In the previous episode on tides, I wasn't ambiguous or vague in the things that I said. I believe I was quite clear. I did not say that you should not give tides, nor did I say that you must give tides. What I said was that there is no rule mentioned anywhere in the New Testament that we should give tithes. And I repeat that. Tithing is part of the Old Covenant. We are in the New Covenant and there is no law in this New Covenant or New Testament saying that we must give tithes. So we do not need to fear if we are not giving tithes. At the same time, Jesus himself said, it is better to give than to receive. So, it is good to give, but not as a law, but out of love for God. Giving must always be out of love. And it should be in faith, not fear. Now, I had a mixed response to the previous episode. One person said I was wrong. That's fine. Others were relieved and happy with this understanding on tides. But there was one email I received, and I think it would benefit everyone to hear the question. Hello, brother. I am a Pentecostal believer. I heard your recent message on tithes, but I have a question. Our pastors say that according to Matthew 23, 23, the Pharisees paid 10% of their income. But in Matthew 5, 20, Jesus says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Quoting these two verses, our pastors are saying, Jesus taught that your righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. So if they pay 10%, you should pay more than 10%. If they fasted twice, you should fast more than two times. In everything, you should exceed them in order to enter heaven. Is this true, brother? Can you please explain the above verses? Well, here is my response. Have you noticed that Whenever Jesus spoke about the righteousness of the Pharisees, he always condemned it. He had zero tolerance for it. Why? Because it was fundamentally the wrong kind of righteousness. It was self-righteousness. It was not merely an inferior righteousness, something that is less good. No, it was a totally wrong righteousness. The righteousness of the Pharisees consisted in the ceremonial and traditional law. They offered sacrifices. They fasted. They prayed much. They gave alms and tithes and observed the ceremonies of religion. But none of these things was done out of love for God at all, but to show people how good they were. So they were outwardly so careful about these things, but they neglected justice, truth, love, and purity of heart. They didn't care for those things but they were satisfied with all their good deeds. They imagined that God was pleased with them. 
But Jesus was unsparing and merciless. He totally and utterly condemned this form of righteousness. So, when Jesus says, your righteousness must exceed their righteousness, how could he mean that we should have more of the wrong kind of righteousness? Let's compare this false righteousness to poison, okay? Is Jesus then telling us that we must have more poison than the Pharisees? Paul was blameless in keeping the law. Yes, he was a righteous Pharisee. But then when he found Christ, what did he say about that righteousness? He said, it is done. If we follow what these pastors are teaching, then we must accumulate more dung than Paul. What then is Jesus implying by saying that our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees? Let me explain with an analogy of an incident that took place in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. Way back in 1992 in Israel, some Jewish people were living in three apartments. This was in an Orthodox neighborhood. It caught fire and they allowed it to burn to the ground. Now, how did this happen? Well, it was a Sabbath day, and by strict observance to the law, the Jews are forbidden to use the phone on a Sabbath day, because doing so was considered a form of work. So while the apartment was burning, these Orthodox Jews, they approached a rabbi and asked him whether using a telephone to call the fire department was a violation of the Jewish law concerning the Sabbath. In the half an hour that it took the rabbi to decide, the fire spread to two neighboring apartments and they all burned totally. Now, this is what comes from strict adherence to the law. And there are Christians today who observe rules so stringently. They are so meticulous, so careful not to break the law, that in the process, they break hearts, they violate God's love, they cause a lot of hurt and pain to the body of Christ, they confuse many non-Christians, and they grieve the heart of God. But what do they say in the end? They say, God understands. And they think that God would stand with them because they are standing for the truth. The scribes and the Pharisees, exactly like this, felt righteous by such strict observance of the law. But their righteousness was not sufficient to grant them entrance into the kingdom of heaven. So, by saying that our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, Jesus is telling us to exceed their righteousness not in amount but in quality. So, a better word for exceed is excel. It's not that we should have more of their righteousness, but a completely different righteousness, a better righteousness. And that's how it is in the New Living Translation. Matthew 5.20 reads, Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the Pharisees. Our righteousness must be fundamentally different from the righteousness of the Pharisees. Absolutely nothing in common. And the difference in these two kinds of righteousness lies in this. Our righteousness comes from Christ. Their righteousness comes from self. The old covenant was a self-centered covenant, but the new covenant is a Christ-centered covenant. We can never offer God a righteousness that pleases or satisfies Him. 
The only righteousness that can gain us entrance into the kingdom of God is God's own righteousness which Jesus brought to us. And how do we get this righteousness? Right at the beginning, it is imputed to us through justification by faith in Christ alone. So we become righteous not by our good deeds, but it is through Christ. It is not what we do that makes us righteous before God, but it is by putting our faith in Christ that we are counted as righteous. So God's righteousness is imputed to us through justification and then imparted to us little by little through sanctification. This is the core message of Paul and the apostles too. And when we do good deeds, God is really interested not in the outward deeds by themselves, but in the attitude of our heart. It is atrocious that the truth of God is being twisted by church ministers and that the church has now become a thriving money-making business through false teaching. Pastors who demand money from their poor and faithful church members must repent. You know, a few days after the last episode on tides, one false prophet made the headlines again. He said that some huge catastrophe is coming to the earth. It's a huge calamity that is going to be far worse than even World War I and II and even the pandemic. And you know what he said? He said that only those who give to his ministry would be preserved. How dare he? With such doomsday prophecies, these false prophets terrify people into giving away their precious hard-earned money. Another passage that some preachers use is about the poor widow in the New Testament. Do you remember Jesus spoke about the widow who gave all she had? In Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 41, Jesus and the disciples are sitting near the temple treasury, watching people pass by and deposit money into the temple offering box. The rich people gave large sums of money. Then a poor widow came by and put in two copper coins. And Jesus commended her for that. Why? This was because she gave in faith and out of love for God. She was in need of charity, yet she had a heart to give. In the Old Testament, we read of another widow, the widow of Zarephath, who gave her last meal to Elijah. Now, how does God look at these things? God looks at these offerings as offerings of love, and therefore he takes care of the widows. And that is why we read that true religion is love. True Christianity is love. We read in James chapter 1 that true Christianity is one that takes care of the widows and to visit those people who are in need. And God loves widows and will take care of them. But there are preachers who use these stories to encourage the poor to give to the Lord's work, saying, Jesus praised the widow for giving, so you must also give. Ha! Before you preach such nonsense, read what Jesus said just before the widow put in her two coins in the collection box. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus said this, Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be more severely punished. So let me say it again plainly to you, my dear friends. You do not have to give money to the church. 
especially if you are in a position where you're struggling with your finances, you're having to pay your house rent, or you are in the process of buying a house or paying your bills and so on, please do not come under condemnation if you cannot give. There is no law that forces you to give. God doesn't want your money. But having said that, let me also say this. It is always good to give. If God has blessed you financially, then give to the poor. Give to anyone in need. And give to your church minister who's laboring for God and for you too. If you feel that he truly loves you and he's laboring for you, give. You can give abundantly and cheerfully when you have much. And what if you don't have? You can still give if you want to give. So if you have money, give. If you are poor and you still want to give, do it by faith and in love. Not out of coercion or constraint. This was how the churches in Macedonia gave a relief offering for the poor Christians in Judea. You see, these Christians themselves were poor, yet they gave happily and Paul praised them like Jesus praised the widow. What did Paul say? Let me read from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the first three verses. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy which is overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. Paul also praised the church at Philippi for their contribution towards him. Let me read from Philippians chapter 4, from 15 to 19. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. And so I say, it is good to give but not out of law or constraint, but out of a willing heart, out of faith, and out of love for God. Let me finish with the story of a teenager named William. Over 200 years ago, a 16-year-old boy named William, the son of a farmer, left his home in Kent to seek his fortune in New York. All his earthly possessions were tied in a bundle carried in his hand. One day, William met an elderly man who listened to his story. William's family had been too poor to keep him, and the only skill he had was making candles and soap. The old man knelt and prayed for the boy's future and afterward gave him this advice. William, someone will be the leading soap maker in New York and it could be you. Be a good man, give your heart to Christ, never lose sight of the fact that the soap you make has been given to you by God. Honor him by sharing what you earn. Begin by tithing all you receive. 
I'm certain you'll be a prosperous and rich man. Now listen, the old man advised William to tithe, but he did not command him to tithe. He did not say it was a law. He did not say it was a rule. But what he said, William, learn to give. It is really a blessed thing to give. So do it in love. And that touched the boy's heart deeply. From then, he began to recognize that God was the giver of all that he possessed. When William reached New York, he found employment as an apprentice in a soap boiler and he learned the business. He then slowly established his own soap and candle business in Manhattan. And soon, William became one of the most prosperous men in New York. Now this is an amazing success story. When asked to explain the secret of his success, this is what William said. From the time that he came to New York, he attended worship in an eminent Presbyterian church. William was baptized at the age of 25. He became a very rich man, but began to distribute his money to foreign missionaries. Throughout his long and successful business career, he was a tither. He gave not merely one-tenth of the earnings of his soap products, but he gave two-tenths, then he gave three-tenths, and finally five-tenths of all his income to the work of God in the world. He supported foreign missionaries, he gave to the poor, and was a regular contributor to the funds of the Baptist Missionary Union. William's full name is William Colgate. Yes, he is the very man behind the Colgate toothpaste many of you use. William never once gave to God's work because he was forced to. He did it because he wanted to. He gave out of deep love for God and in profound gratitude to God. So dear Christians, whether we are poor or rich, let us understand that to give is a grace. Let us not turn what is described as a grace of liberality into a burden. Do not give out of fear and do not give to those who demand money from you. Do not give thinking that you have to and do not give to a minister who doesn't truly labor for you, who doesn't care for you or doesn't love you. But if he's a man of God who loves God and who truly cares for you, then give abundantly to him. And remember to give even to the poor. And as Paul says in Philippians 4.17, may fruit abound to your account. God bless you.